The parade went on despite the rain. It formed up just before 9 a.m., even as dark low clouds moved in from the west. The day's forecast was for heavy showers, and sure enough, Tulsa would get them. But it was Memorial Day, and Tulsa would have a parade and a damn big one come hell or high water. This was a city that bought $33 million worth of war bonds, sent thousands of young men into military service, and prided itself on not just its patriotism, but its Americanism. It even observed an Americanism day. And when the 1920 U.S. Census concluded that Oklahoma had the nation's highest percentage of native-born citizens, Tulsa celebrated that, too. Oklahoma comes nearest to being a pure American state of any in the Union, editorialized the Tulsa World. We are tremendously proud of that classification. During the war, Tulsa had demonstrated its vigilance against foreigners, slackers, and Reds, the more zealous going so far as to meet out beatings and hot tar to the local membership of the industrial workers of the world. Others, deemed insufficiently loyal to the cause, were made to see the light. A few were packed off to insane asylums. Now, two and a half years after the war's end, the fervor had scarcely waned. Despite the threat of rain, Tulsa's lined downtown streets as motorcycle cops roared up Cincinnati Avenue from 5th Street to 7th, then west to Main and north through the heart of downtown. A 70-piece band drawn from the local musicians' union followed. And then came the veterans, scores of them, from the Grand Army of the Republic and the Confederacy, through the recent war to end all wars, walking or conveyed by various means through the fat raindrops splattering down on the town that called itself the Magic City. Written accounts are silent on whether Tulsa's black veterans, and there were many of them, were included in the procession, but it does not seem likely. Quite a few white Tulsans thought putting black Americans in uniform had been a mistake in the first place. Soon, they would consider their opinions grimly vindicated. The parade had just reached its end at 2nd Street and Elgin Avenue, when the skies finally opened full throttle and chased everyone to cover, soaking hats and spring dresses and fresh linen suits, wilting the red silk poppies, handmade by the children of France, in every lapel. Every true Tulsan, every true American, wore the crimson flowers that morning as symbols of sacrifice and patriotism, and also of American strength and generosity, for the poppy sales helped feed the starving children of Europe. As the parade wound down, participants and bystanders piled into their Nashes and Overlands, Buicks and Chevys, Maxwells and Mitchells and Hupmobiles. A few may have shoehorned into variations of the Tulsa Four, a little runabout made right there in town. Everyone drove five straight as an arrow miles along the Federal Drive to Rose Hill, the new cemetery on the east edge of town, where so many war dead were buried. The living stood in the downpour, heads bowed, listening to Tulsa's most decorated son of the Great War, Lieutenant Colonel Patrick Hurley, a future Secretary of War, eulogize his fallen comrades. Little did they imagine that even as they memorialized the dead of distant battle, a deadly calamity of Tulsa's own had already been set in motion.